I changed the, the title of uh, my presentation a little bit uh, with border cultures and uh, cross-border cultures, the case of Central and Eastern Europe. And I uh, started uh, with uh, some remarks uh, concerning uh, the controversial notions, center and periphery. It is possible to explore and assess Europe through the notions of center and periphery. To what category do, uh, do uh, these two notions belong? What can we judge from them? Can the science of history operate with these two notions? Do they imply partisanship, therefore distorting the truth? How can one establish the center and the periphery of a cultural space? Are these notions interchangeable? Provided that we agree upon the importance of a civilization structure, what is the point of introducing a center-periphery type of approach within a cultural historical investigation? The above questions are particularly legitimate to address since the notions under discussion reflect differences rather than similarities. They pinpoint to subordinations and contradictions characteristic of two cultural geographies rather than the unity in diversity of one and the same continent. In the case of political debates, the use of notions like center and periphery could be an excuse for those who want to clarify for themselves the meaning of terms and various languages. When this use represents the motivation for an academic endeavor, such an approach could become limiting. Its theorization might be tributary to prejudices and its results subordinated to transient ideological interest. Time and space have been differently quantified <clears throat> depending on individuals, various religious traditions, varied cultural historical past, specific notions and languages. The categories of space and time therefore signal the existence of certain specificities. Nevertheless, they do not justify a historian's allegiance to dichotomous approaches to be used as tools of investigation. Moreover, the above mentioned realities suggest forms of human existence without <coughs> generating or describing relations of any possible nature between an alleged center and an imaginary periphery. Likewise, a number of seminal contributions over the last couple of decades have promoted an innovative perspective on Eastern Europe and the culture of identity on the European continent as a whole, placing in doubt the limiting approach already mentioned. While a culture manifests itself in a certain socio-political context to which it is related, history is the result of interpretations that can facilitate the understanding of that particular culture, of a system of values, of a people and civilizations. It can lead to the identification of individual and collective mindsets specific to a particular era or location. History can be a narrative about the past, but it is also not a linear one. It is not hindered by various religious, ethnocultural, national, or economic prejudices on the ground of which one would seek to justify the present state of affairs. What is certain is that it is impossible to define center and periphery as notions with a clear-cut meaning accepted by the majority of European cultures. When uh, these two notions are actually chosen and used in various <coughs> uh, 
locations, their meanings are not similar in the minds of different people and communities. This happens because they are not fixed, unchangeable points of reference the two notions presume. Instead, there is a historical process that people can learn about, one in which spiritual, social, and economic factors intertwine in order to show how we are at a particular moment in time, an idea well remarked in 18th century by Gian Battista Vico. Put differently, in the case of Europe, center and periphery are figments of our imagination. A remarkable example in this respect comes from English and American literatures, which have constructed a genuine imaginary geography of the Balkans. In her book, Inventing Ruritania, The Imperialism of Imagination, Vesna Goldworthy explores the archetypes of the Balkan Peninsula and its words due to long-established literary and film productions by famous Western artists. These archetypes emerged in the 19th century and have ever since percolated in society. Used by politics uh, and by the mass media grounded industry of consciousness, these archetypes do not only function as clues towards the falsification of realities, but they also reveal the manner in which the Balkan region has been exploited as an object of dominant cultures, dialogues about themselves. As a result, the society, and especially the elites of the Balkan region, have had to learn not only the vocabulary of the West, but also the stereotypes it has assimilated. Apparently exonerated from any possible accusation of racism, the cultural and political language of the West has created through the notion of the Balkan an other that could be blamed for anything. In response, Vesna Goldworthy maintains on the basis of a rich array of arguments that the Balkan Peninsula is part of Europe <coughs> despite the fact that the adjective Balkan can mean the opposite of European. Meanwhile, the practice of using the Balkan adjective to refer to one's neighbor have, has often been the result of ignorance and bigotry. Deploring nationalist interpretations, conceptual history promote a comparative and transnational approach to intellectual life by trying to decode both the shared and the separate meanings of notions from one language to another, by exploring the numerous cultural transfers, the genuine and false ideas contained within languages, discourses, and text. In the case of Central and Eastern Europe, conceptual history is a particular innovative research method since it has to confront the above mentioned stereotypes that have been widely perpetuated over the course of time. Europe is a mixture of political and economic systems whose origins lie in multiple religious and cultural values, which in their turn are tributary to the location in which they initially emerged and were later developed. The specificities of Europe derived from its <coughs> multitude of allegiances, including Catholic Rome, the Orthodox Byzantium, the Protestant North, the Mediterranean South, the Anglo-Saxon or French-Dutch West, and uh, the Central Eastern, the Balkans, and the Russian East. The groundwork for renewal was originally established at the time when uh, Europe was organized in principalities, kingdoms, and empires, when uh, cities and regions, regions inhabited by several linguistic and religious groups constructed together a census communis. The modernity of Europe 
which dates back to an earlier time than that of the emergence of the idea of nation, dates back to the 18th century, to the Enlightenment period. But when uh, we don't have the modernity exactly uh, in the sense of the 19th century and 20th century, we don't have national idea in 18th century. <coughs> uh, it was a possible in 18th century the transnational condition and meanings of the continent's history. That means to have another explanation for 18th century, 17th century, 16th century, uh, uh, and before, like the 19th century or the 20th century. It's not possible to combine both languages, the language of the modern era of the 19th century and 20th century uh, with the languages of the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. <clears throat> it's very, very important for clarify this kind of, uh, of uh, aspects uh, when uh, we, we start to interpret the history. And the history is very important for political thinking, yes? Without historical background, we don't understand the political thinking and the political languages, yes? <clears throat> if you don't know the revolutions or the, the main events of the 20th century or the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century, you cannot understand the nowadays European language, yes? European political language or European unity problems. <clears throat> On the other hand, we must acknowledge the fact that each region of Europe is to be defined not only on the basis of various communities, but also in light of the historical legacies and mental reflexes acquired by each of its places of habitation. Political experiences rationalized within some form of procedural thought and the logic of political life make up just one of the initiatives of the modern world. Under the circumstances at stake is the logic of the state understood on the basis of natural law and covenant-based functioning, one implemented thanks to a constructed rational apparatus and the logistics that guarantees an enhanced level of legal constraints. During the stage of transition towards moder modernity, but especially after the commencement of moder modernity proper, the social and liberal understanding of the concept of culture became relatively similar all over Europe. There were intellectual circles, those such as those of Central, Eastern, and Southeastern Europe, where differences on the basis of social status and profession did not play the same fundamental role as in the West. That is very important for understanding the Central and Eastern Europe. To be more precise, in Central and Eastern Europe, the process of modernization occurred less via strict specializations, unambiguous administrative norms, and a minutely elaborated judicial system. It primarily really instead on cultural encyclopedic minds thanks to the contributions of a series of remarkable personalities that had been innovative in many areas and that had shown their attachment to both traditional spiritual values and new intellectual ones without finding a contradiction between them. The Russian or the East Central European intelligentsia, for example, perfectly illustrate this type of direction since, on the one hand, they were influenced and uh, in contact with Western ideas while, on the other hand, they developed a modern cultural concept which intertwined the originality of their own culture, historical religious and identity-related views, obsessions, or harmonious perspectives with radical critical viewpoints. May I have two or three minutes? Okay? Yeah? Thank you. In his studies, Maurice Chaki, a historian from uh, Vienna, 
has demonstrated to deep connection, the deep connection between official political life and the life generated by diverse cultural, artistic, literary, historical, or philosophical forms of expression. Uh, please see Ideologie der Operette und Wiener Moderne. Uh, <coughs> ideology der de Operetta and uh, Modern Wien. The world of Central and Eastern Europe identified itself with its own behavioral peculiarities transmitted from one generation to another. On the one hand, it accepted change. Its memories and cultural correspondences suggest a space of experiences and the horizon of expectation that can be found in the multiple cultural code of the populations inhabiting the regions of Central and Eastern Europe. Under the circumstances, the search for essences and problematization become extremely important. That is why any attempt to recontextualize cultural creations by their literary, musical, or artistic aspects contributes to our understanding of individual and collective mentalities and mindsets. Multiple coded cultural legacies, Filfach Codirum Culturelle Serbes, and creations have survived to this day all over Europe. In Central and Eastern Europe, they are part and parcel of identity. It is uh, with them that we associate the elements due to the great bureaucratic reforms of the Habsburg state, which resulted in a commonly shared culture that can be found in an Austrian Germanity, institution that led to the formation of behavioral reflexes, empirical terms indicated administrative, juridical, economic, and political subordination, the establishment of the ruling royal house as reference point and the symbol of citizenship, a German language pe paper with expressions originating from several communitarian languages, like uh, Czech, Polish, Hungarian, Italian, or plurilingualism. All these aspects show how individuals and collectivities from the above mentioned area acquired similar models. Therefore, their politics, justice, and economy were based on the same principle. This multilingualism was functional everywhere in the cities of Central Europe during the 18th and 19th century. For example, in the cities like Cluj, or uh, Timisoara, or uh, Budapest, or, uh, or Bratislava, Pressburg, or Novi Sad, uh, Neusad, Suividek, uh, several languages uh, play important role. Uh, Two or three languages were uh, usual for everybody inside of the society. <clears throat> uh, as a result of uh, uh, the conceptualization of multiculturality or uh, plurilingualism and modernity in the regions of Central and Eastern Europe had no connections with utopias, the Habsburg myth or the emperor's myth or other myths. Instead, it was grounded upon historical realities and deeply tied to an inimitable heterogeneity of the cultures functioning in these areas. Consequently, any theory aimed at the conceptualization of modernity in Central and Eastern Europe must take into consideration the geography of the place and the distance itself from interpretative models borrowed from contemporary postmodern, yes, we are, especially the young people, very postmodern, yes. And uh, the young people probably don't understand exactly my explanation in this moment, because I talk about modernity. And they think in the postmodern uh, 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 formula. <clears throat> it's very important for the young people to, to connect with us and with our generation for the understanding of the modernity. <clears throat> Please read the last uh, book written by Vargas Llosa who explain exactly what means this spectacle of postmodernity. <clears throat> the, uh, 
the analysis of multi and the interculturality in the areas under consideration should constitute a mandatory part of historical investigations, one which is often ignored by studies whose analysis start from the present day configuration of states and politics. Located at the crossroad of the West and the East, Central and Eastern European spaces have benefited from the influences of both civilizations, with Western influence, influences prevailing over Eastern influences or Oriental influences during the last uh, two centuries. Despite this tragic course of events and despite the tensions resulting from a faulty management of the relations between different community of ethno-national states, especially in 20th century, <clears throat> the multi- and intercultural realities survived until nowadays. They were and often remain a unique ferment for all sorts of creations, one which maintained the bridges of communication among various cultures and state entities from Central and Eastern Europe. This is one more reason why I think that the analysis and assessment of history, and especially border culture and cross-border culture, significantly contributes to a more objective understanding of Central and Eastern Europe. Thank you very much. <laughs>